This is the Human Action Podcast, the weekly show looking at politics and events through the lens of economics, with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Robert Murphy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another Human Action Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, my new co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy, looking a uh, pretty solid beard today. Bob, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thanks, Jeff. It's growing in at more than 2% annually, so okay. you might have to okay, uh, that's all we ask. pump brakes on it. That's all we ask. <laughs> so, we, you know, last couple of weeks, we've been talking about war, economy, and inflation. We've been talking about oil and some of the other shocks we're uh, experiencing right now in the economy. But I thought this week I wanted to bring up with those two things in mind, just some of the examples of economic ignorance we're seeing in, in the political sphere, in the media sphere. I mean, it really is something. It's shocking. And, and if we think about this, folks, you know, we wouldn't want to send our kids out into the world without being able to read and write, right? We have a word for that, illiteracy. And we wouldn't want to send our kids out into the world without having the, you know, the ability to make change at a cash register, to perform basic ar- arithmetic functions. We, we would call that innumeracy, right? So we have terms for this. But economic ignorance is really dangerous because if we think, what if 80% of society was illiterate? We think, well, that would, that would yield an elite class of politicians and media and maybe clergy or whatever who controlled and were able to snow mm-hmm. uh, the, the population with these ideas because they can't read. And so in, in essence, we have that with respect to economics, right? There's no easy term for economic ignorance. I'm, but Mises and Rothbard both talked about this a lot, but, but we send our kids out into the world and they're really susceptible to political nonsense from the political class because they don't understand basic economics. And so, you know, Bob, just in the last week or so, we can talk about Jerome Powell's uh, press conference earlier this week. But, you know, we had this, this statement by Biden where he said, you know, I'm sick of people not understanding how great the economy is doing. And I'm sick of them blaming me. This is because of Putin and yada, yada. And, and uh, Nancy Pelosi, somewhat slurring, I might add, uh, came out and said, oh, no, no, it's a myth that more government spending creates inflation. It actually fights inflation. Well, OK, I mean, if you're not equipped mm-hmm. to consider that with any sort of economic background or understanding, I, I mean, it allows her to almost sort of drop the pretenses and just say things that we know nakedly are untrue. Well, yeah, and I think it, it's I'm curious to hear if, if you had a similar reaction, Jeff. It seemed to me that like in the 1980s, for example, basically all economists, except you know some really heterodox ones, agreed that an aggressive hike in the minimum wage would cause unemployment among teenagers. Like whether you were left, right, or center, that was kind of standard. And then in the early 90s, you know, there was a famous Card Kruger study, and then now it's gotten to the point where nope, that's in, in fact you're just showing how ignorant you are that you're not up to speed with the latest empirical literature. And you know, and I have been doing some work on that stuff just to try to show like the the tricks they use to make the standard results disappear. But be that as it may, and so it's and you know after the two thousand eight financial crisis, there were people like me warning about price inflation, and then it was like nope, no no inflation, you know. So you you guys are crazy, and so it's gotten to the point I think where anything goes, and then of course MMT. So it really is. You know, this idea, oh, no, spending using up resources and, you know, causing problems that that's that's something that's true at a corporate level. Corporate level has a budget. But, you know, the, the U.S. Mm-hmm. government with with uh, its monetary sovereignty, this, you know, those rules go out the window. So I've, I've gotten this sense that people literally don't think there's economic laws anymore. And and so, yeah, why couldn't Pelosi just yes. get up there and say that? Um, you know, I was I was trying to just in the interest of fairness, run through and say, is there any sense, like, is there any school of thought that would justify what she would say? Because she could, because I was thinking you could argue, oh, maybe she means government spending creates more employment. And then if the production of real goods goes up, but no, even in a standard, like new Keynesian model, if the way you boost output and reduce unemployment is, is by boosting aggregate demand, it's still true that prices end up being higher than they otherwise would be. It's, you know what I mean? So it's, I, it's like literally I can't think of any way to justify that. And she's clearly just saying, you know, like you said, because there's no accountability. The people who hate her already still hate her. And the people who liked her, they're not going to be bothered by that comment. Well, uh, cl- clearly, there's lots of people who think unbridled government spending uh, boosts the economy. I mean, that's that's a 
a, a mainstream view on the left and, and somewhat on the right as well. But when you say there are people who don't believe in economic laws, I think that's absolutely true. If you follow Per Byland on Twitter, and you should, mm-hmm. um, he jousts with these people. Uh, you know, people say, oh, economics is, is astrology for white men. Uh, it, you know, it's just a pseudoscience which was made up in the last few hundred years, and it's all this sort of pseudo-intellectual veneer for capital or for business interests. I mean, there's lots of people who believe that, that you can, you know, using legislative fiat, you can command and control an economy. You can basically uh, will or legislate production and direct production and distribution. I mean, that's that's absolutely, uh, I think, a, a widely held view in America. I don't, I don't know how widely held... But um, that's that's definitely real. Yeah, and it's I'm I'm a, I'm a sort of ambivalent about the whole thing because on the one hand I do understand like just to, to motivate this Jeff I remember I was at a at a holiday celebration with like relatives from the other side you know so they weren't people that had known me and they were so a lot of them were meeting me and, oh what do you do Bob and okay I'm an economist da, da, da. and then somehow you know the economy came up and 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 they um and I don't remember what the specific issue was but they asked me what do you think about such and such. And so I gave my view and I, you know, and I, of course, was not a bomb thrower. I was pretty reserved in what I said. And, the, you know, the other guy just matter of fact goes, well, I don't think that what I think is. Did it? And I was just thinking, you know, if I had been a heart surgeon and talked about how the aorta worked, I don't think somebody would have said as he was cutting his steak. Well, no, I disagree with that. My theory is, you know what I mean? And but then on the other hand, I realized, OK, but there is a sense in which I understand why the public trusts heart surgeons more than economists. And so, you know, I, 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 I do understand why, you know, th- that they do seem like after the after the crash, you had guys like Eugene Fama after the, the housing crash. I'm talking about Eugene Fama was given interviews saying, well, what do we even mean by a bubble? I mean, if everyone knew there was a bubble, it would it would pop. And so clearly the bubble's not even an operational mm-hmm. term. So when you have guys, you know, Nobel Prize winners saying stuff like that, you can kind of see why people nah, I don't I don't trust these guys. Well, that's tough. I'm kind of of two minds on this because obviously the Mises Institute exists in, in part, maybe even in large part, but certainly in part to try to educate intelligent lay people. In other words, we don't just have an academic function. So I want average people to read some economics and think about it. And hopefully that would make them, again, less susceptible to these politicians and their, their promises. But the flip side of that, and, and I'm, I have sort of a populist bent. I, I, I think expertise has, has uh, or, or technocracy has served us pretty poorly in the 20th and now 21st century. But all that said, I do think we need experts. I, I do think that a PhD in economics is, is really a, you know, something that separates a person from, you know, a lay person like myself who has simply read on, on in my own time, some some economics, some Austrian stuff, and, and and some other stuff. You know that that level of knowledge, of course, can make you more dangerous mm-hmm. be, because maybe you don't know what you don't know. Um, but yeah, it is interesting that everybody has an opinion on economics, but not everybody has an opinion on heart stents uh, or, or or something like that. Um, you know, but with with all this inflation happening right now. Uh, which is real and which even the the Fed and the federal government are are owning up to, you know, the highest in 40 years. And a lot of people like John Williams at Shadow Stats and Peter Schiff talking about, hey, if we calculate inflation, CPI inflation anyway, the way we used to, it would probably be well over 10 percent, maybe 15 percent, maybe 20 percent. It was interesting, Bob, if you caught Jerome Powell's uh, hearing the other day, uh, one, one thing he said was that the economy is very strong. And I, I just wanted to throw this out there because when we think of a strong economy, when we think of GDP, when we think of corporate profits, when we think of unemployment, we, we think of all these these numbers in dollar terms, in numerical terms. And of course, when inflation is high, the, the numbers don't mean as much. And, and I was actually... Uh, looking at Mises last night in uh, Nation, State, and Economy, great book that a lot of you should check out. And because it seems like we're back into this this Cold War footing almost, which I hate, we'll, we'll get to Steve Forbes in a second. But you know, he brings up war costs and inflation. He says what happens is that, um, and he's writing this right after the, the lessons of the first, the Great War, World War I. He says, well, you know, the volume of notes issued went beyond what businesses could have absorbed, even in the war-induced increase 
in their demand for money, you know, to build tanks and bombs and planes. So that's going to end up, the consequence of all this is going to be what the quantity theory describes. So I thought that was interesting. But he also gets into some of the accounting issues for companies, which I thought was really fascinating. He says accounting is not perfect. And it's especially imperfect during times of inflation. And so accounting not only goes to corporate balance sheets and profits, but it also goes to our, you know, our national accounting, GDP, whatever you want to call it. And so he says, you know, there's, when there's a decline in the value of money, that um, has a distortive effect on balance sheets because, yes, your cash, you know, you can reflect your, your cash on the asset and liability side, that, that, that's cash. And we can understand that in terms of its newly reduced purchasing power. So both the asset and, and, and liability side, you know, your notes payable, your notes receivable, your cash versus your, your current short-term debts, those are, are, nominate, are denominated in dollars. So we can understand that that purchasing price went down uniformly on both sides of your balance sheet. But on the, on the asset side, maybe your inventory, which is a current asset, maybe that reflects the new higher price. But, but your older fixed assets, like your factory, your plant, mm-hmm. Uh, you bought that at, at the old, you know, using the older, uh, more valuable money, and you booked that on your balance sheet at that older numerical amount, and and since then you've been depreciating it on your balance sheet at that older amount. So so that has a, a hugely distortive effect on uh, on corporate profits. So so inflation, it's not just bad because we're all getting poorer. It also distorts our understanding if, if what a company, for example, is doing is, is profitable or losing money because economic calculation, uh, which, you know, the argument which he made so strongly back in the 20s, uh, you know, that requires a, 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 some sort of fixed uh, numeraire, a dollar, for example. And, that, and if the value of that's radically changing or in this case radically declining, that screws up everything, Bob. I mean, we're, we're – we're in sort of uncharted territory. I know he lived into the early 70s, so he certainly experienced uh, or saw some of that uh, inflation under, you know, uh, pre-Volker. But, you know, I, I'm not sure that we're really getting how how nasty this is in terms of its its effects on the economy. We, right. I mean, that's, that's all uh, great insights from Mises that you're uh, reflecting there. And it's yeah, just to make sure that the listeners get it, it's thinking of it as, you know, as revenues are coming in, as, as you're using up some f- fixed capital, you know, to use a standard uh, phrase, that you need to be setting some aside, like in a sinking fund or whatever, in order to. So if you're a bakery, at some point, you got to replace the oven. So that's, you know, it's not like quick things like buying more milk or whatnot that, you know, to make the muffins every day. But at some point, after long intervals, you got to replace the oven as it wears out. And so, out of your current receipts, yeah, you need to be setting money aside for that. And so, yes, if prices in general are going through the roof, then your customers are coming in armed with these new dollars. And it, it, from your perspective, it looks like demand is booming. Everybody likes my muffins a lot more than they did two years ago before the war started. And so you're, you know, do it. And it looks like you say, like you're booking a great profit. And, and so, yes, the specific mistake is the amount that you're depreciating in terms of like each year, oh, 10% of the value of that oven disappears, let's say. In terms of the accounting and so yes that if you're booking it at the old even if you are trying to make an adjustment if the adjustment really isn't reflecting how much is that new oven going to cost three years from now when i have to go out and buy the new oven if you're off in that estimate then you're might not be setting us aside enough right now and then and yeah mises even talks about that the shopkeepers go and they buy their wives you know new coats or something thinking wow business is booming and it's it's all a mistake right. so it leads to what he calls capital consumption so that's how right. it's physically possible that people, you know, how is it that we can all of a sudden have new coats for the shopkeepers' wives and, or or husbands? You know, we could it could, it could be a, a female shopkeeper, and and so how is that physically possible? It's because resources that should have gone into maintaining the existing capital stock are getting redirected into consumption goods, and you can do that for a little while because the economy is real complex and interlocking, and it's a long time structure. But you're sort of painting yourself into a corner, and then that's why the crash is inevitable. That's why I just deficit spending once there's a problem can't fix it because it's literal you know historical mistakes have been made male investments and and some of that capital consumption is being disguised as profits right right it's being distorted and so let's say the baker let's say a commercial oven for a baker costs 100 grand and he or she has been putting away 10 grand a year 
in, in a sinking fund with that in mind, and they continue that same 10 grand in an inflation in a more inflationary environment, well, they're not they're they're effectively only putting nine grand or whatever. Right. right. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's the thing is they don't they think they're being frugal. They they don't realize they're consuming their capital. They think they're just taking some out of their excess profits. When in fact, like you say, that they in that environment they actually need to be putting aside a lot more because again, the problem is that the oven when it comes time to replace it is going to cost a lot more than it used to. And even if they know that and try to make an adjustment, if they're off. Then all of a sudden they realize, oh, I thought I had enough to buy a new oven. I've only got enough to buy 85% of a new oven. So there's a sense in which they consumed 15% of that oven. Well, so Mises writes a lot about war socialism. He writes about it in, in Socialism, the book 100-year anniversary this year, 1922. Uh, and he writes about it a little bit here in Nature, State, and Economy. And, you know, after listening to Powell a couple days back, it was interesting. He, you know, he had a pretty rosy take. He said, we're struggling with inflation, but other things, hiring, um, growth, GDP, uh, corporate profits, yada, yada, are, are all the, – the economy is very strong, right? I, which is what uh, Jerome Powell said. I don't know if I buy that. But you know, what he didn't account for is when we talk about war socialism, that doesn't necessarily only mean that America has to be involved in an active hot war. It could be the resurrection of the Cold War. And, you know, we spent a lot of money uh, prosecuting the Cold War, which, thank God, never came to fruition, I guess, in the form of a nuclear exchange with Russia, with the Soviets. But nonetheless, there are costs to that, opportunity costs. And uh, it, it sounds like there are people who want us to get back on that old Cold War footing, no less than Steve Forbes. I'm going to read you a tweet from him. Uh, folks, I, and, and Steve Forbes is a great guy. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, obviously a brilliant guy, well-read guy. And this is not, he's not some sort of economic ignoramus. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a very, a very serious person. And he, he's far more serious than a Nancy Pelosi, right? I mean, we're ruled by unserious people. We're surrounded by unserious elites in media and academia and politics. Steve Forbes is not an unserious person, which makes this a little more uh, unpleasant. So here's Steve Forbes back in February 24th. U.S. must now begin massive military buildup on the scale Ronald Reagan did in early 1980s, necessary for credible future deterrence to bad behavior by Russia, China, and Iran. Oh my gosh, you wonder, Bob, where is this money coming from? Yeah, and I mean, it's 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 standard on for people that are on the right, that they, even ones who are ostensibly you know, free market, that they do have this huge exception carved out for, you know, military spending is the one area where when you say, yeah. oh, government's not the solution, government's the problem, except when it comes to the military. They're, you know, the same people mm -hmm. that we couldn't trust to fix the inner city. They can go revamp the Middle East, no problem. They can, you know, bring democracy yeah. to Iraq, no problem, because all of a sudden U.S. Congress works very well and, you know, they give the correct orders and such in, the, in that kind of a scenario. Well, and of course, that, that, that really is socialism, right? You, you literally have... Uh, c control over resources owned by the U.S. federal government. Soldiers and personnel are employees of the federal government. They are directed by the federal government. I mean, th this this truly is a segment of the population. Excuse, excuse me, sorry, a segment of the economy. National defense, we'll call it, uh, oftentimes offense, um, run in a in an openly socialistic manner. Right. There's even like those T-shirts that say like property of the U.S. Marines and stuff. You know what I mean? I mean it's a yeah. bit tongue in cheek. But yeah, I mean, but literally, what's the one area where if you signed up, it would be harder for you to get out? It's, you know, you would rather be doing that at a Walmart than the Marine Corps in terms of like, yes, yeah. I want to work for you guys. No, I changed my mind. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and again, in um, Nation, State and Economy, he's got one of his uh, great quotes, and and this gets quoted a lot. Where he, you know he says, "Look, no, you know every unprejudiced person can have no doubt that war really causes no economic boom, right? At least not directly, since an increase in wealth never results from the destruction of goods. We all we all get that actual bombing of buildings or something. But you know, yes, war brings good opportunities to the producers of munitions, yada yada." That's my third yada yada, I think, in this show. I've been watching Seinfeld reruns <laughs> late at night. Um, but it, it's offset, on the other hand, by losses of other branches of production and that real war losses of the economy are not affected thereby. War prosperity 
is like the prosperity that an earthquake or a plague brings. That's a famous quote from Mises. So it, it seems like sometimes we lose sight of this even even now. Right. And it's I think it does flow out of Keynesianism. Like if you and even like the 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 mindset obviously predated 1936 and John Maynard Keynes actual work on that. But yes, this if, if you're thinking in general that government spending has the capacity to jumpstart the economy or just in general, hey, if business is slow, what do we need? Well, if people would just spend more, if it would just be Christmas every month, then we'd never have a recession. And that that is a typical view that people have held you know, for centuries. You, know, you can see you know, some of the classical economists railing against that, J.B. Say, you know, famously. And so uh, if that's what you think, then actually it, it doesn't seem so outlandish, the idea that, well, if there's a, a big war, and especially if your country is not directly being bombed, but is more just supplying the munitions that you know both sides are, or <laughs> both sides are ideally, mm-hmm. if you're really just in the for, for the money, but at least one side's using in the victors, and you get paid back, then you know that's you can understand where they would where they would get that idea. And this is where Bob Higgs' work is so crucial. And let me just mention. So what he did is he showed, for example, that because you, you can look at the standard statistics, and yeah, it does look like GDP like during the 30s was obviously terrible in the Great Depression. And then when did GDP just zoom up? Well, it was during the war years for the United States. So isn't that prima facie showing, you know, say what you will about the the ethics of it, but you can't deny. And it was really just a definitional trick that when the government spends $10 billion on tanks, that is included in GDP full stop. When the whole reason, you know, there's lots of problems with GDP accounting anyway, but the the theory being if the consumers are spending money on it, that, that that's a sense of a measure of how much it's, you know, it's, it's value comparable to other things. We're using dollars as the measuring rod. Again, there's huge problems with that, but okay, it kind of makes sense. Whereas when the government spends $10 billion, that's not the same thing as consumers spending their own money, right? Like military contracts are famously inflated. And so that just, that shows you that it's not, I'm not, I'm not making an ideological observation here. It's not that I don't like military spending. I'm saying just the nature of, in terms of the economic analysis, the reason we might say $10 billion of spending on cars in a sense shows there's $10 billion of real output that doesn't work when you transfer it to the government because it's, it's involuntary. And even the political officials, it's not that they could pocket the money themselves. It's not like a king who raises tribute. And then if he goes and spends money on horses, you could say, oh, that's a legitimate expenditure on horses that, you know, is, is national output because he valued them. No, the, the political process in a democratic republic, those political officials do not get to pocket the money. So they have no incentive to make to, to watch costs. So the whole system is different. Mm-hmm. And that's it. So it is artificial. The, the home front during World War II had a much lower standard of living than during the depths of the Great Depression. And so that just shows the U.S. was not richer during the war years. It was only after. But yet with a, but with a higher GDP. Right, right. But yeah, by any real metric, you know, even in terms of the official statistics, like real, per, you know, private consumption per capita was way down, again, using the official number. And the other thing, too, just real quickly that Bob Higgs demonstrated was they had price controls in place. And they didn't account for that, right? So, so just in general, if the if the Fed prints a bunch of money to pay for the war and then prices double, the fact that nominal GDP doubles would just be a wash, right? That re, you know real GDP wouldn't have have moved if if just expending goes up by you know a factor of two and then prices double, but the the government just made it illegal for prices to go up. So that isn't actually mm-hmm. making there be more nylon stockings available. It just means it's mm-hmm. it's not showing up in the statistics because they're literally not letting the denominator go up. So that's another thing, too, to show why those GDP statistics from the war years from World War II are just completely nonsense. Well, it doesn't inf- – inflation, especially the kind where, you know, true monetary inflation, which we've seen the, from our central bank given, you know, the COVID issue. Um, but in, in fl- that kind – inflation juices GDP, right? You – if if you in, in inflate five percent, and then you you say, "Well, GDP went up five percent," that sounds like some sort of victory, right? So what? Yeah, and what I'm saying though is like in even mainstream standard economics, they're not that dumb. Like they they do have an allowance, and so right. you, so when we report, you know, when the mainstream press reports, ah, the the Bureau of Economic Analysis released the latest GDP figures for last quarter, that means real GDP, and so they are adjusting for price. So if yeah. It wasn't that, in other words, Zimbabwe, everyone, like the Keynesians thought Zimbabwe was doing great. 
because wow, real incomes are rising a million percent per week over there. Mm -hmm. No, they would say they would look at the real thing. You have to say nominal expenditures compared to some price index. And I'm saying, but yeah, that the real GDP calculations that the official gov you know government releases for the 1941 to 45 do not take into account the fact that they had price controls in effect. And so it's it's literally it's like they let the the numerator go up, but not the denominator. Well, what do you think of this idea? And Powell was harping on this. Um, you know, we have our inflation mandate, and we're going to stick to that, and we're going to get back to that. And we we recognize we meaning the the Federal Reserve Board. We recognize that inflation is is a problem. And he, to his credit, he said, look, especially poor people, they spend a much higher percentage of their income on basics: gas, groceries, rent. Okay. Um, so, so that's fine, but this idea that we're going to get it back to our inflation mandate of let's say two percent, which is really a, the the Congress created a an inflation man a dual mandate. Congress was involved in that, but the two percent number is mostly a central banker contrivance. So, how do we disabuse folks of the idea that a little bit of inflation is good, and it's just lots of inflation which is bad? I mean, it's I've I've done this before, uh, you know, when when we've had conversations, Jeff. But again, just remind yourself, the guy down the street. If you discovered that he was in his basement using a fancy printer and he was cranking out hundred dollar bills that really looked like legit hundred dollar bills, I mean, Walter Block would say there's no such thing as a legitimate hundred dollar bill, but you get the idea. Then, um, and he's going around spending stuff. It, there's no sense in which he could say, oh, well, I'm not doing it too much. It's not that, you know, I'm causing hyperinflation. I'm just I'm just stimulating trade. You know, it's, it's good for the local businesses and th that we would recognize that. No, you're you're not contributing anything. You're not actually working and you're not or it's not that you're you, you have some real assets like farmland and you're contributing eggs and, and gallons of milk to, to this overall supply mm -hmm. just by you creating more money. That doesn't make us richer. And geez, if everybody did that, that clearly wouldn't work. So you, there's a sense in which you're cheating it's, it's sort of like you know someone cutting in line to say why doesn't everyone do this this is just cuts the weight down this is this is such a no-brainer just cut in line duh you know that's the kind of thing that, yeah maybe one person does that or a few people that benefits them and hurts everybody else but clearly you know it's not a social boon and that's what printing up money does it doesn't make us richer and so yes it's true that having the, the fed create a hundred billion dollars and give it to a politically connected friends isn't as bad as creating a trillion but it's still bad. It's not. It's not helping anything when you understand, you know, what what it, what what function does money serve? And this kind of goes back to the earlier discussion, Jeff, where when you when you ask what is it that money does for us, you know, it helps mm -hmm. with economic calculation. You know, in the Austrian tradition, that's something that they really understood well, better than other schools of thought. And that that ability to help people decide whether resources have been efficiently allocated using accounting. If the, if the value of the monetary unit's wildly fluctuating, then th that ability to perform that task breaks down. Well, if you think about the level of public, I don't know if ignorance is the word, but uh, lack of interest in economics. I mean, you go back to Henry Hazlitt's age, and he, he obviously wrote for the New York Times for a long time, but he also wrote the Business Tides column for Newsweek. For a long time, many, many hundreds or thousands of columns, and he, you know, he's really focused on inflation. We have a whole uh, book we sell in our bookstore, which is just as his his uh, uh, Newsweek columns, uh, you know, for, which were called Business Tides, and it doesn't feel. Maybe I'm wrong, Bob. Maybe this is, happens on Twitter, or maybe it happens places like the Mises Institute or, or John Tamney at Real Clear Markets, but it, it feels like we don't have anything like that today. We don't have erudite economics uh, for the lay person in mainstream media. Right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I know when I was gr growing up, I, I would get um, – my dad had a subscription was called the Conservative Chronicle that was like a, a digest that mm -hmm. would compile all the op-eds from, you know, self-styled American conservatives. And I used to gravitate. So like the, the Walter Williams and the Thomas Sowell columns mm -hmm. were the ones that, you know, I really gravitated to. And that's helped what, you know, steered me to becoming an economist. Um, but yeah, it's, it really, you know, so there's that great booklet, um, you know, Murray Rothbard's Making Economic Sense. But obviously, Rothbard's not right now alive publishing stuff. In, in he's mainstream. still publishing, Bob. Well, he, it's true. Yeah, he's published more yeah. since he died than I think I have since I've been alive. But um, but yeah, it's, 
you're right. It, 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 I guess part of it is, well, I, I don't know. I think, I think, yeah, it might be that because of the, the splintering of audiences and venues that the people who do have yeah. real hard hitting analysis, they're, they're not op-ed columnists that are getting run in USA yeah. Today, typically that they have, you know, they have their well, own I podcast know. or blogs. But Walter Williams had a syndicated column, I believe. Right. Um, but I don't think has Soul ever had a syndicated column. Um, I, I don't believe he, so. so it's, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I again, yeah, I don't know what his contractual relationships were. Yeah, so I I know the things that I had like you would see Walter Williams more often. But but again, they it was the Thomas Soul would often it, it, this and this was back like in the late '80s, early '90s is the time period I had yeah. in mind. So yeah, I, I don't know, you know, if if that was discontinued as he got older and became more of a elder commentator. Well, but even you know, Road to Serfdom was printed in serial form, mm -hmm. so, a truncated version, and I think something like 1949 in Reader's Digest. R right. I mean, imagine imagine if like you got I don't know what's a what's a magazine that people still get. I, I I can't even think of a physical print one that have much circulation. But let's say People Magazine or or no, I, I mean let let's say you get Newsweek or Time today, um, and I mean imagine having uh, Bob Murphy or Safety Namus or something in serialized form. I, I mean it's it's almost unthinkable. I think I think the internet has probably dumbed down economic discourse more than it's raised it. So yeah, I think there's two different things going on. And so, yes, on the one, because there are now these niche platforms available. So if you want to go learn Austrian economics, you could go to Mises.org and, you know, if you follow Pear Island yeah. on Twitter or whatnot. And so because of that, I think that means, or, or put it to you this way, it's not surprising to me that CNN is worse now than I remember it ever being because the people who actually wanted objectivity would have left long ago. So at this point, who are they catering to? It's just people who hate Trump and, and what, you know, and don't really care. They just want to hear what they already think. And, you know, you, there's obviously yeah. examples of that mirror image on the right too. I'm not just saying it's, a, it's merely a left wing thing. And so I think there is, there is that element that is, is the options available to people have proliferated the people that are stuck, you know, watching ABC news to find out what's going on in the world that's a different, you know, that's a smaller fraction of the population now. And so, the, you know, and the, the people making that those news segments respond to that. They realize who their audience is. Well, did you have economics in high school or not? I did. I, I had one class and it was taught by the football coach. And oh, not that the foot, that means, you know, he's not smart. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you could, you could be both. But in this particular case, the, the, the guy was not the most erudite professor I had or, they, or teacher right. I had. And they, they, they were treating it like health or gym or something as, as a non-core thing. I, I wonder what percentage of kids today have econ in high school. And, and I think there's, for, for our purposes, I think we ought to be thinking about homeschoolers and getting more materials into their hands. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, and, and that is partly why I'll, I'll go ahead and plug my book, Economics, uh, Lessons for the Young Economist. It's, it's free on Mises.org, folks. Go ahead and look that up. You can get it. And there's a teacher's manual too, if you're, if you're the parent. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's partly why, you know, we, we decided that I should go ahead and write that is that there was, it, it was partly too, that what we end up doing is sort of, uh, it's, it's like we were in triage or something in the ER when people would roll in and, oh my gosh, we got someone who believes in Keynesianism. We need, you know, some, some, uh, Austrian economics stat. And we thought, no, why don't we just teach good economics on the front end where before, you know, people absorb all these bad ideas just from the culture and, you know, what, what smattering they'll get in their like history class teaching about the Great Depression. And oh, what happened was there was untrammeled capitalism. And, and that's, you know, in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, thank goodness FDR came in later to fix things. Um, so, yeah, it's it is unfortunate that there is a lot of economic ignorance. And then but like I say, it's I can understand partly why it persists, because mainstream economists have been wrong about a lot of things. And so they don't have the same credibility that chemists or heart surgeons do. And so it's, so it, it's Austrian economics is solid. And even like old school, classical economics, there was a lot of wisdom there, mm -hmm. you know, free trade mm -hmm. price controls don't work, that sort of thing. Printing mm -hmm. up money raises prices, duh. But um, unfortunately, yes, the efforts in the 20th century to make economics a real empirical science failed for all the reasons that Mises and other Austrians explained. 
And yet the public is aware of that and they can see that they go, oh yeah, that the today's economists are often, you know, a priestly class that's just justifying government spending and doing what you know the people in power want. Yeah, that really is something, the way empiricism has failed and the this math envy, this desire to treat economics like a physical science where you have you have a hypothesis and you test it against an empirical observable reality. I mean, that that has failed. And I think people smell, a, average people smell a rat, right? I mean, even uh, Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan were saying, no, I don't think there's a big problem in housing, for example. Uh, so economics, I think, is not, as a profession, is not doing much good today. And sorry, Bob, and I would argue that it's probably doing much bad uh, in terms of far from providing intellectual cover for business interests or capital, I think it's providing intellectual cover for government, for politicians to, you know, you know, you can always get an economist to say, oh, well, see, raising the minimum wage in Seattle didn't to $15 an hour didn't cause unemployment. Unemployment went down. Well, that's because the prevailing wage with big companies like Microsoft and Amazon and tons of jobs, you know, 10 or 15 years ago in, in Seattle – the prevailing minimum wage was 20. So it was above the minimum. And it, it, so, you know, employment was, was unaffected. So I think, I think we got a real, uh, a, a real long road in front of us in terms of correcting all this. But that said, uh, if you're interested in Bob's book for young economists, for younger kids, or if you have uh, students or grandkids or anybody in your life, uh, just hit me up via Twitter and, uh, and I'll get that out to you. Also, for older kids and certainly for college students, Bob's book, Understanding Money Mechanics, which we just published towards the end of the year, and which we're actually going to have an event surrounding that book coming up in a couple months in Orlando, I think is, is just hugely recommended because it's, it's a whole course on money, uh, the history of it, how it arose, uh, how it, it has value, uh, how central banks work, how, you know, it, e it even goes up to the present day when we're talking about the crazy uh, uh, central bank policy since the crash of 08. It, it discusses Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So it's a fantastic single course on money, which anyone would benefit from, but especially students. And uh, so we can, we, you know, hit me up. And again, we'll get that out to you as well. Happy to send you that. A great book. Uh, Bob, I think that's the show. Do you have any parting words for us on this this topic of economic ignorance? Well, yeah, let me just close with one real quick anecdote. So when I was in grad school at NYU, there was um, the UAW came in to unionize the grad students, you know, because we were so oppressed. We had to grade papers and so forth. Couldn't believe it. Right. So I actually was I was forced to, to join. You know, I was against it, but oh. I, I was literally forced. So, you know, so I was briefly a member of the UAW, believe it or not, folks. But during so the administration didn't want this to happen for obvious reasons. And so the I don't know if he was the provost, one of the head of honcho was going around to the various departments asking the grad students, you know, why are you so unhappy? What, what's, what can we do here? You know, we, it, it's really, we don't want the UAW coming in here and getting in between you and the faculty and whatever. And, and, and so the, one of the, my classmates, so getting a PhD in economics at NYU, which at the time was, you know, top 20 school said, oh, well, um, we, we want to get subsidies for housing, right? Cause the Columbia students, they, you know, they get a break on housing. And the guy said, Okay, we, we can do that right now. We just give you the money and your stipend. But if you want, we can reduce the cash we give you each month and then give you an option to you know get a break on NYU housing. But we figured we're giving you more options by just giving you the money and letting you do what you want with it. And this guy actually said to him, no, 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 because NYU owns the apartment buildings. It doesn't cost you anything to give us a break on the rent. So I want the same stipend and a break on the rent because it doesn't cost you anything to, to give me a cut. And his kid's getting a PhD. Well, he's, he was a, in his 20s. And and I realized, yeah. you know, so he was from Turkey and he was one of our better students because he was really good at math. And I, it just blew my mind. And I realized like he's never read Walter Williams or Thomas Sowell or Henry Hazlitt or Murray Rothbard for sure. And so, you know, the, the way, you know, to get, you could get a PhD in economics in a very, you know, prestigious school the way these programs are set up and because you are good at math and you know how to solve for equilibrium states and, and such and such, but you don't know something like opportunity cost. Like you, he had gotten to that point and that had never been spelled out to him or to see a fallacy, you know, because he hadn't read something like economics in one lesson. So I, I do think there is this issue that yes, PhD econ economists might not know basic economics and that, and that's how it can happen because nobody Many ever, such cases, yeah, Bob. Yeah. 
many such cases. So that was UAW as in United Auto Workers? Right, right. And why they... Really? Yes. (laughs) But I think auto workers make a hell of a lot more than NYU grad students. Uh, well, they work more, sure too. That. So. <laughs> yeah, they work more, too. Well, I, look, I, I was a member of a union. I am a former union member, not by choice. I, we had to be when I worked at San Diego Airport. So I'm glad to know that both Bob Murphy and I, Dr. Bob Murphy and I, are union men. So on that, I think we got to close the show. Uh, we're going to be back next week with another episode of the Human Action Podcast. And we're going to start to have some surprise guests on to join me and Bob because, you know, uh, we've only got so much between our ears. We need to bring in some smarter people uh, than, than us mere mortals. So, Bob, I want to thank you for your time. We'll link to, to, we'll link to Bob's books in the show notes on YouTube and otherwise. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Have a great weekend. Catch Jeff and Bob next week for another show. But in the meantime, you can find a world of content like this at Mises.org.